Hi, it's Pastor John Haggard today on Treasure Top Ministries, part two of the message, How to Forgive What You Can't Forget. How to forgive what you can't forget. And like I said in my previous message, if you're anything like me, there are some things we all have a hard time forgetting, or maybe in some cases, if we're honest, we really don't want to forget because we just feel like that person does not deserve to be forgiven for what they've done. So how can forgiving someone really help us if we are not the ones who did the harm? Or what if we were the ones who caused the hurt? Is there any hope for us at all? Well, we're going to learn the answers to those questions today. We'll answer them. And before we start, let's go to God in prayer. Father, today as we read your word, please show us how we can apply what your word teaches and how we can experience freedom from our hurts and how to forgive others and how we can be forgiven of our past, present, and future sins and how to be doers of your word, not just hearers. Thank you that we have your son, Jesus Christ, and that he is our advocate in heaven who intercedes for us by praying for us, even when we don't deserve it. And Father, for those who do not know you yet, we just pray that they will become saved by your work in their hearts, for we know it's by your work in us, not by anything we do, not by our work, that we become saved. And Father, would you remove all distractions from us, that our minds will be alert, our eyes watching, our ears listening, and our hearts receptive to what you want to do in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, before we dive into how to forgive what you can't forget, I'd like you to know we are a listener-supported ministry. Our programs are not aired for free. We must pay for all programs because Media outlets also need financial support to continue operating and to be able to offer programs like this one to its listeners and viewers. So if you enjoy our time together today, and if there's something in the message that is of real value to you, please consider supporting Treasure Top Ministries with a generous tax-deductible gift. Just go to treasuretop.com and click on the Give button at the top of the menu. We'll share more ways to connect with us later in the program. And your gift of any amount whether it's $5, $50, $100, or even $1,000, your gift will be responsible to help more people learn about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the true freedom that they can enjoy, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And even if you can't afford to give it this time, I certainly understand these financial times we are going through, and your prayers for Treasure Top are even more important. And I'd also like you to know that if it's not in the Bible, I don't preach it. And if it's not in the Bible, I won't call you to do something that is not clearly rooted in Scripture. And most important, I do realize who's in charge here, and it is not me. My job is obedience to preach God's Word and to follow His Word faithfully to the best of my ability, not to add to or to take away from God's Word. God's job is outcomes. What He does with you for what you hear today is up to him, not up to me or anyone else, because it is God who changes our heart. Did you know that our greatest need in life is forgiveness? Here's what author Max Licato says about our greatest need. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a Savior. John 3.17 in the NIV Bible says, For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. When it comes to the issue of forgiveness, our natural tendency is to condemn rather than to forgive. And that's because it's a lot easier to condemn than it is to forgive. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, to label, libel, or slander someone actually can make some people feel really good. All you have to do is look at what's been going on in politics. Even lifelong friends are canceling each other for having differing opinions. I've seen postings by people who I thought were a lot like me in their opinions, only to see what was posted, and wow, I just couldn't believe they would post such hatred and condemnation. Condemnation and unforgiveness are in many ways like first cousins. It's hard to have one without the other. So it can seem double hard to forgive what we can't forget. 
And in the world we live in, it can oftentimes seem like no one wants to forgive anyone for anything. Before we can learn how to forgive what we can't forget, we have to first understand where the unwillingness to forgive comes from, to understand why people are quick to condemn and slow to forgive, or or in some cases just quick to condemn and never forgive. In the most basic sense, unforgiveness is a condition of the heart. Everything that comes out of our mouths is a direct reflection of our heart. And if we look at how Scripture defines the heart, we see at least six components that reveal the heart. First, we find grief in the heart. John 14, 1, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We also find desires of the heart, and some are not good. Matthew 5, 28, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We find joy in the heart. Ephesians 5.19 says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. We also find understanding in the heart. Matthew 13.15, Jesus said, For the heart of this people has become dull with their ears. They scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. We also find thoughts and reasoning in the heart. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And finally, we find faith and belief in the heart. Hebrews 3.12 in the NIV says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So to sum up the six components of the heart that we just looked at, Jesus tells us that the heart is a storehouse for the good and evil and what comes out of our mouths, good or bad, it all begins in the heart. Luke 6.43 to 45, For there is no good tree that bears bad fruit nor, on the other hand, a bad tree that bears good fruit. So what does a hardened, unforgiving heart do to someone? Well, I think the main sorrow is that unforgiveness shuts down the ability to give or to receive forgiveness. It's kind of like a concrete wall that can't be you know, penetrated. And it doesn't matter whether someone is a Christian or not. Anyone's heart can harden. It's hard to know how to give something that's never been given to you. So if someone has never received forgiveness, they don't know how to forgive. Likewise, for someone who has never felt loved, so how can you forgive if you've never been forgiven? And how can you love if you've never felt loved? Pastor Robert Jeffress said, if you do not receive God's forgiveness in your life, you will be overwhelmed by guilt. And if you refuse to extend forgiveness to others, you will be overwhelmed by bitterness. Both emotions are lethal to your physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, and that's why Jesus said, our greatest need is forgiveness, end quote. In Matthew 6, 9 and forward, Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray and speaks about forgiveness. The Lord's Prayer contains the words, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and the words, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. From that scripture, Jesus tells us why forgiveness is our greatest need, to forgive others and to be forgiven. Christ forgave us, and we must forgive others. Now, have you ever heard somebody say, you know, I'm never going to forgive that person for what they have done to me? And maybe you wondered, well, is that person a Christian? How could any Christian feel like that? Well, being a Christian does not mean you are free from human emotions and reactions. It can be natural to struggle with forgiveness due to hurt, anger, uh, other strong emotions. But the why happens from the statement, I will never forgive that person, is hindering one's relationship with Christ who has already forgiven them if they are a Christian. In essence, they're blocking the ability to rely on God to help them with forgiveness and blocking the ability to be set free of anger and bitterness and resentment and unresolved conflict. Remember when I said it's not what you eat, it's what eats you? Now, you might say, I'd like to learn how to forgive, but Pastor, the Bible, it's a big book. I don't know where to start to find out about forgiveness, even if I wanted to. Well, one easy way to get started is to buy a study Bible, such as the Quest Study Bible, Quest spelled Q-U-E-S-T, And I recommend the NIV version published by Zondervan. 
In the back of the Quest Study Bible is a concordance, which is essentially an alphabetical index listing of words used in the Bible text. It allows you to look up key words, just like a dictionary. And it gives you the Bible verse references where you can go to see for yourself what God's Word has to say. The Quest Concordance has over 2,000 word entries and about 13,000 scripture references. For example, if you look for all of the words on forgiveness that we're talking about, like forgave, forget, forgets, forgetting, forgive, forgiving, and the word forgiveness itself, you'll see 29 scripture references. So any of us can quickly go there and see what God's Word has to say. So if you struggle with forgiveness, and we all do from time to time, a great way is to hear God speaking. And you know how you hear God speaking? By opening the Bible and reading. A lot of people can quote you sports statistics all day long, but can't recite one Bible verse. They can tell you how to play football, but they can't tell you how to forgive. And that's because they are spending all of their time in the wrong playbook. The other part of the question that we are covering today is how do you also receive forgiveness from God, no matter what you've done ever in your life? Well, first, we need to understand there is one thing that God will not forgive, and it's mentioned in Mark 3.22, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he, meaning Jesus, is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. And I think when Jesus knew what they were saying or thinking, he said, all right, let me set them straight. So he called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables, beginning in verse 23. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. So the unpardonable sin that is not forgiven is rejecting the power and authority of the Holy Spirit who is working in the world today through Jesus Christ and instead crediting that power and authority to Satan. Someone can actually speak a word against the Son of Man, and that's God in human form, Jesus Christ, and be forgiven for speaking against Him. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. And if you look at it, blasphemy and unforgiveness are closely related, like first cousins. And because Jesus is not on earth at this moment in time, no one can attribute the miracles of Jesus to Satan instead of to the Holy Spirit. So where this really leaves us is the only unpardonable sin today is continued unbelief. For anyone who dies rejecting Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is no pardon. John 16, 7 and 11 tells us that the Holy Spirit is at work in the world, convicting the unsaved of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus said, but very truly I tell you it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate, now that's the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. End quote. Did you know if you are a Christian, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. All you have to do is call on that power, and when it comes time to forgive others, the Holy Spirit is what you draw upon in order to forgive. Because our natural self, living in the flesh, doesn't want to forgive anybody. Before I tell you the incredible story about a sinner who was a murderer of Christians and who was forgiven by Jesus Christ... If you'd like to hear a replay of this message in its entirety, go to treasuretop.com and under podcasts, there you will see a link to how to forgive what you can't forget, parts one and two. That's treasuretop.com. And you'll also see all of our contact information as well as other messages to help you make life work when life doesn't want to work. And sign up for our free newsletter. And if you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation of any amount to help us continue to deliver messages like these, just go to treasuretop.com and press the Give button at the top of the website. Now back to the message. 
Now, here's an incredible story about a sinner who was forgiven by Jesus Christ and who was a murderer of Christians. We're talking about the Apostle Paul in his own words, as recorded in Acts 26, 10, and 11 in the NIV. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blasphemy. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. God used a murderer of Christians, Saul, who was also called Paul in the New Testament. And if God can forgive a murderer of Christians and make him writer of over half of the New Testament, don't you think he can also forgive you and me? And don't you think that if he can forgive you and me, that we should also be able to forgive those who have wronged us and be able to release all of that anger and bitterness and resentment and unresolved conflict that we may be harboring? All of Paul's sins were forgiven by Jesus Christ, not just some sins, all sins. And that means that all your sins can be forgiven too. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you harmed someone or someone harmed you. So if you're still hanging on to bitterness or self-condemnation, why let someone or something continue to gnaw at you, to occupy your mind, to rob you of your joy? John 8, 36 in the NIV says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that means as a Christian, you have been set free. One thing to understand about the forgiveness of God is that forgiveness is conditional upon one, our confession of sin, and two, our repentance of sin. Acts 3.19 tells us, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out at times of refreshing may come from the Lord. When we confess our sins, we open the door in our relationship with Christ, acknowledging our sin and our part in it, and we're agreeing with God about our sin and that a change in behavior will be the evidence of a genuine willingness to turn away from the sin. We have to understand that sin remains unforgiven unless it is confessed and repented. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the good that we get out of the confession of sin is not an act of self-condemnation, but of seeking God's mercy and provision of the remedy for sin in forgiveness through Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, what if I'm not a believer? Is it too late for me? Well, let's see what the Bible says. The Bible speaks of those who belong to God, yet who have not yet believed in him. The Apostle Paul that we were talking about earlier, his conversion on the road to Damascus is one example. God chose Paul, and Paul belonged to him, even though Paul had not yet believed in him. And to other unbelieving religious leaders at the time, Jesus said, You do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. John 10, 26 in the NIV. Notice that Jesus does not say, you are not my sheep because you do not believe. Instead, he says it the other way around. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. How to understand God's truths, his choosing us, Romans 9, and our responsibility to confess and believe, Romans 10, it's really impossible for us to understand fully, but Scripture says both perspectives of salvation are true, John 1, 12, and 13. When the Apostle Paul said, be imitators of God as beloved children, Ephesians 5, 1, he was referring to the call to perfection. God's children, that's the body of Christ, all who are Christ followers, should emulate the Lord and reflect his perfection in their lives just as children often copy their parents. Nobody's perfect, and God does not expect us to be because we can't be. Even though we are called to perfection, Matthew 5, 48, But this does not imply that we can attain God's level of holiness and perfection, since God is the only one set apart in holiness. Exodus 15, 11, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? And don't forget there's one more part of forgive, and that's you forgiving yourself for what you have done to others. And you might say, you know, no good God would ever forgive me for what I've done, so there's no way I could forgive myself for what I've done. But you would be wrong if you think that. A lot of people are tortured by guilt. 
It's true that we are often our harshest critics. We talk more to ourselves than we do to anyone else. However, if we trust in God's grace, Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now to the final part of my message today, the big distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. And knowing the distinction between the two can set you free from the pent-up anger, bitterness, resentment, and the unresolved conflict that may be literally running your life and ruining your health. Which brings us up to the notion that many people have, and that is, well, you know the Bible says forgive and forget, and if I can't forget, then I can't forgive. Well, the Bible actually does not say that. We've seen a number of verses commanding us to forgive one another, including Matthew 6.14 and Ephesians 4.32. A Christian who is not willing to forgive others will find his fellowship with God hindered. Matthew 6.15 says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And lack of forgiveness can also reap bitterness and loss of reward. 2 John 1.8, Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Of course, to truly forget sins that have been committed against us, that's a hard ask. We do have memories. Some of us have elephant memories. We never forget anything. So to consciously select which events from our memory that we're going to hit the delete button on and others that we're going to remember, well, that's pretty much impossible to do. While the Bible states that God does not remember our wickedness, Hebrews 8.12, God is still all-knowing. God remembers that we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But having been forgiven, we are justified in his eyes. Heaven is ours as if our sin had never occurred. And if we belong to him through faith in Christ, God does not condemn us for our sins, Romans 8.1. In that way, God forgives and forgets. If we say forgive and forget and mean I choose to forgive the person who hurt me and I'll move on with my life, then that would be a Christ-like course of action to take. As much as possible, we should forget the past and strive toward what lies ahead. Hebrews 12.15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. However, if by forgive and forget one means, I will act as if the sin had never occurred and I will live as if I don't remember it. Well, that can lead to trouble. For example, a woman whose husband physically assaults her can choose to forgive him, but that does not mean she has to act as if the sin had never happened. To spend time alone with the abuser, especially if that person is unrepentant, is not what Scripture teaches. No one is required in Scripture to open their doors to instantly welcome back an abuser. Just because we forgive someone, forgiving does not mean that we instantly must trust that person because we have forgiven them. The difference between forgiveness and reconciliation is that reconciliation requires a reestablishment of trust, and that trust must be earned. So when someone violates that trust, we need to first observe and see a significant major change in that person's behavior, if that person's ever going to be welcomed back. The Bible teaches that it's wise to take precautions, and the dynamics of the relationship will have to change. Proverbs 22.3 says, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Jesus told his followers to, quote, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Matthew 10, 16. In keeping company with unrepentant sinners, we must be innocent, willing to forgive, yet at the same time shrewd, being cautious. In conclusion, forgiveness is not just a moral obligation. It's a spiritual regimen that can transform our lives. By following God's word about forgiving others and even forgiving ourselves, John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can experience healing, restoration, a deepening of our faith and truly conquer how to forgive what we can't forget. Pastor and author Robert Jeffers said, quote, how do you know if you have experienced true worship or true revival in your life? True worship occurs when a child of God, having heard the word of God, is prompted by the Spirit of God to obey the Word of God. No goosebumps or sensual experiences. Forgiveness is the cornerstone of immense power to heal our hearts, restore our souls, and mend broken relationships, end quote. Forgiveness is a free will decision. We choose to forgive or not to forgive. 
But since God commands us to forgive, we must choose to obey God and forgive. In some cases, the one who offended us may not want forgiveness and may never change. But that doesn't abolish God's desire for us to have a forgiving spirit. Matthew 5.44 tells us, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ideally, the one who offends will want to seek reconciliation, but this is not always the case. But whatever they decide to do, we who are wronged can still make a decision to forgive. If you enjoyed our time together or got something out of today's message, would you consider making a generous tax-deductible gift to Treasure Top? As I mentioned earlier, we are listener-supported. We do pay for all of our programs to be aired simply because the media outlets also have expenses and they need payments from us to help continue operating. There are three ways to give your tax-deductible donation. You can go to treasuretop.com and click on the Give button at the top of the screen. Or you can text your donation with the word GIVE to 844-553-1590. That's the word GIVE to 844-553-1590. And if you prefer, you can mail your gift to P.O. Box 210-615, Nashville, Tennessee, 37221. That's P.O. Box 21615, Nashville, Tennessee, 37221. Thank you for considering a generous donation in order that we may continue to spread the saving grace of God's Word. You can also sign up for our free newsletter to receive Life Change Moments, and you can also subscribe to our free podcasts and listen to this message again and watch or listen to other messages that we have on topics like The Biggest Lie You Have Ever Been Told, The Four Seconds That Could Save Your Marriage, the two words you do not want to hear from God, the letter to the devil, the only MBA degree you will ever need, how to stop a heart attack, how to break through your past once and for all, what happens if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and many more topics to help you make life work when life doesn't work, especially because we are always in one of three stages of life, in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or about to go into a crisis that we didn't even see coming. And if you have a prayer request for you or someone you know, just go to our website, treasuretop.com, and click on the contact link. And you can email me anytime, john at treasuretop.com. That's john at treasuretop.com. Father, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word today. Thank you for your mercy, keeping us from what we deserve. And thank you for your grace, blessing us with what we don't deserve. Thank you, Father, that your Son has paid our way to heaven by his death on the cross, by becoming sin for us, and by paying all of our sin debt in full for all who accept him as Lord and Savior. And help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now it's Pastor John Haggard saying, until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen.